So when I first moved to Turkey, I didn't know any Turkish, zero. And for the first six months that I lived here, I lived with my in-laws who didn't know any English. So I'm sure you can imagine where this is going. There was a lot of gesturing and a lot of head nodding and a lot of crying on my part. Uh, but eventually I began to learn Turkish. I had to in order to survive and to communicate and to feel like I could be part of the family and the community. I had to learn. So I took some lessons and I learned some grammar and I didn't often use it correctly. Um, my children, on the other hand, they just absorbed the language like sponges. In fact, they soon became my translators. And this was sort of the inspiration for early bird English, watching my children learn language in such a natural way in an immersion environment. So I've taught English here in Turkey now for, for many years. I've worked in public schools and I've taught private lessons. I've taught groups and one-on-one. -on -one. My youngest student is three years old and my oldest is 61. So I feel like I have a pretty solid grasp on the Turkish English as a second language or ESL student. And no matter how different all of those students are, either by age or interest or level of English, there's always a few common characteristics that are across the board. Students always learn better if they're having fun, when they're interested in the topic, and when they're motivated to learn. At the onset of COVID, when we saw the education system transition into an online setting, it felt really foreign and unwelcomed. Here in Turkey, many ESL classes initially just transitioned into an online format using programs like Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Now, for grammar or lecture style classes, these programs work well enough. Unfortunately, with group classes, this format creates a whole slew of challenges. Now, the challenges only increase when the classes are speaking classes or any class that requires substantial participation. And this, in, this, this challenge also increased when the learners are young children. And this is also the case for teens with a beginner level of English, yet to develop a desire to even learn English. But the reality is, is not everybody can have private lessons and group English classes are necessary. So how can we nurture spoken English for young children in a group setting? And how do we get our teens excited about an English class? particularly when it's online and with a teacher that's just lecturing in a language that he or she may not understand. Right now, while technology is still changing and developing to meet such needs, the skill sets of the teacher and his or her training really play a significant role. When it comes to young students, there are multiple factors that need to be considered. While online platforms like the ones highlighted on this slide are good options for one-on-one -on -one instruction, how can we tailor online ESL classes for larger groups? Experts say that 70 to 93% of language communication is actually nonverbal. For ESL teachers, this is an extremely valuable piece of information to have. Let me share with you a personal experience. As I mentioned, when I moved here, I didn't know any Turkish. I remember somebody was asking me a question about my husband, but I couldn't understand Turkish. The person didn't under, uh, speak any English. They also used no body language. They were somewhat expressionless. And no matter what, what was said, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Another person that was close by picked up on my lack of understanding and started to do this. Immediately from those small gestures, I was able to understand that the question is about my spouse. When we're in a classroom setting, body language and movement is easily picked up on. Obviously, a two dimensional screen complicates this use of reception of body language. Now, this is where a technique like total physical response or TPR when we're teaching children can be incredibly beneficial. TPR is a teaching methodology that incorporates movement and modeling by the teacher. These actions cue a response from students. So, for example, if I want a young learner to answer my question, it might look something like this. Hi, my name is Jenny. What's your name? It's great to see you. 
This method really engages students, especially if the student, especially the students with low English levels. The use of movement and uh, provides physical information that students associate with language. Of course, this is a method of teaching that teachers must be taught. And it's my personal suggestion that ESL courses and training centers uh, include this kind of training with teachers, particularly if classes continue to remain online. And while it doesn't solve all challenges with an online group, it certainly is an extra tool in the belt of the ESL teacher. But what about teens? How do we motivate our teens that sit behind a computer bored by online classes? These days, I also teach at a high school. And to be honest, my most successful students have been the gamers and the YouTubers. What's interesting to note is that there's no formal teaching going on in either of these platforms. What there is, however, is a lot of exposure to language. And more importantly, there's a self-motivation to learn. These students really want to learn English because they want to play online games with youth from around the world, or they want to watch DIYs or music videos. And that is the kind of motivation that drives success, success in language learning. And that is also the kind of motivation that as an ESL teacher, I need to tap into. Why is my student even in the class? Does he or she want to be there? Did his parents force him to participate? When I work with students and particularly teens, I always consider my number one job is getting them to love English. In a classroom, you have the opportunity to joke and to interact with students and to play games and really engage with each other and engage with each student as an individual. And when we're online, I think we often feel like we're racing against the clock. And as a result, these relationships don't often get the same importance. But taking a moment to notice a teen's haircut or the posters on the wall behind them, these are key factors in forming connections and possibly finding what may motivate that student. Let's not forget that social interaction is a significant part of the classroom experience, and we can't just turn on a screen and get right down to business. The relationship is also part of the language learning experience. I want to backtrack a moment and bring up the gamers and the YouTubers, students who have learned language with no formal teaching. I'm a big believer that it's possible to have kids learn without actually knowing that they're learning. Just as young children learn from being exposed to language, the more exposure that we can give our youth, the more that they will absorb and the more excited they'll be. This is where, especially with teens, using programs like Instagram or TikTok, YouTube, and such social media platforms can actually become great learning tools. Rather than having students fill out a worksheet, having them create an Instagram page about something that they're interested in is a great alternative. Having them record their own YouTube video or using movie clips and TV shows that they're interested in for listening exercises. These are ways <clears throat> that we can make English relevant to our youth. Let's face it, most teens are probably watching movies during your online classes anyway, so you might as well at least have them watch something as part of your class. There are also new programs that have come on the scene recently like Kahoot. Kahoot is an excellent platform for competition between students. It's fun and it's in real time. It feels competitive and it requires participation. Teachers can either create their own questions or use questions that are already stored within the system. They then give a password to their students and students compete against each other and against the clock to answer these questions. It's testing knowledge, but it feels like a game. And this is a perfect example of innovation that's really hit the mark as a teaching tool. When we combine a well thought out online platform with fun and relevant questions from a teacher, this becomes an excellent online ESL tool. I also believe that we need to rethink the way that we test our students. What are the goals of language learning? Is it to memorize grammar rules and perform well on tests? Or is it to be able to use language to communicate effectively and comfortably? Let me show you one of my favorite examples of this. This is a test from one of the students that attends the high school that I teach at. So as we see, the question reads, what are some of the pros and cons of working in the fashion industry? The student answers, how would I know? I've never worked in the fashion industry. 
Did he answer the question as his teacher had intended him to? No, but his understanding and response was quite ingenious actually. He demonstrated understanding of the question, humor, and a very natural response. And this is exactly the type of language learning and interaction that we should want our students to be able to demonstrate. Rather than obsessing over grammar rules, let's get students to use language in context. If he was my student, I would have given him full marks. I think the coming months and years will really be exciting as we start to see more changes in online ESL learning. Imagine programs that allow students to attend ESL lessons from around the world, for example where each day you have a lesson from a teacher in a different country. Imagine the chance to learn new accents and dialects and even cultures. Imagine teaching technology that's tailored to meet the interests of students and how such innovation would create a more engaging experience for that student. I think down the road, we will see these changes in the system and there's a potential for a really exciting ESL experience. But alongside these changes, teachers must also adapt and change. Training for online classes for topics as basic as how to use Zoom, as well as new skills like TPR must also be taught. Finding ways to connect with students online and meet their ever-growing need for technology and then incorporating that back into our lessons and the learning experience will also be key. It takes creativity and it takes an ability to think outside the box. As instructors, we need to be okay with changing to meet the needs and the interests of our students. We need to create an environment where they're learning even though they don't realize they're learning. And we need to help them stay motivated and develop a love of learning the language. I hope that today I've been able to highlight the importance of motivation and immersion learning, good training, flexibility, as well as what hard work can do to, to improve a situation that we didn't necessarily think was ideal. But if all else fails, and just like some of my more challenging students in the class, I've not been able to capture your attention and convince you, then never underestimate the power of humor and a good prop to help grab the attention of your students. Thank you for your time. <laughs>